Hello and welcome to this special episode of Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope 2024 brings you peace. I hope it brings you connection and I hope it brings you the strength to continue this crazy fight that we are in to save each other, our planet, our cultures and all that is good about humanity. A week ago, I emailed all of my subscribers on planetcritical.com asking them to fill out a Google form with any burning question they may have around the show or about me. A lot of you wrote back and today I'm going to be going through some of these questions, answering them as best as I can. I actually thought that most of the questions would be more personal around uh, how Planet Critical came about, uh, where it's going, (laughs) um, who are you, Rachel, (laughs) but... They were actually mostly about the predicament of the world. Lots of people were asking for my opinions on different things. Lots of people asking where we're going. And I'm going to do my very best today to try to answer some of these to the best of my ability. The first question is from longtime subscriber Tim Coombe. And it is truly excellent. And it had to be the opener. The minute I saw it, I knew it had to be the opener. It is... You've had many answers to your opening question, all of which go some way to approaching a single dimension of the meta-crisis. Is there a picture building in your head which brings together and synthesizes these threads or could start a conversation to do just that? (laughs) Oh, Tim. Yes and no. (laughs) Um, Is there a picture building in your head which brings together and synthesizes these threads? There is, yes. And I've started to untangle it recently. And it's about um, energy and economy and language and trying to see the holes through which our understanding falls through due to language, ironically enough, Um, and trying to paint a better picture of how all of these things that we consider to be conceptual, like economics, like GDP, um, are actually very much tied to the biophysical world, to the real world. So that's definitely one part of it, like trying to show how everything kind of centers around natural resources and the organism's drive to grow. Another part of it that I've been working on for a while is definitely violence. Um, The innate violent urges and impulses uh, that are within each human, really, Um, and trying to grapple with why are they there? How do they become maladaptive? How does this drive become maladaptive? Um, Is there an adaptive way of using this violence or giving place to this violence? And what do we do about the maladaptive drives of the few who seem to have very violent impulses? I think the difficulty with the meta crisis or the poly crisis or the world in crisis is that there is no single dimension. It is fundamentally a big picture problem and it is impossible to grasp a big picture all at once. I often try to think of a globe. Uh, It's impossible to see a globe from all angles unless you're using mirrors or cameras and as much as we can try to hook our brains up to computers or create um, artificial intelligence for the moment, we just have uh, one brain and it is connecting with each other and communicating with one another and sharing stories and ideas that provides these extra perspectives and extra angles. Um, But we need to see all of them in order to grasp the big picture, which is why it will always be a, a dimension of multiplicity and extremely complex. But for now, I would say that the world is in crisis because humanity grew too fast and our cultures didn't evolve with it because it was, I suppose, fine to be warring in groups and out groups, uh, competing over natural resources when there was abundance. But now we need to share and we need to learn how to love and we need to learn to see past differences. And until we do that, I think the world will continue to be in crisis. And I think we all know it's much easier to be hard than it is to be soft. So really, we've just taken the easy route out as often as possible and hey ho, set the planet on fire. (laughs) The next question is from Jordan L. What political ideology would you say you closest identify with? This question is, (laughs) I thought about um, leaving it out actually because I was like, oh, maybe it's maybe it's not interesting enough. Sorry, Jordan. Uh, But I think it is very interesting uh, because The more I thought about it, the more I realized uh, I don't really, there is no one particular political ideology that I identify with. And I think um, it's important that we all start trying to move beyond ideology, if I may be so bold as to give (laughs) all of us advice. 
Um, it is deeply important to have a set of values and beliefs, say, but it's more important that those beliefs can be fluid. Uh, perhaps not that the values are or the morals, but the belief set that accompanies them, that makes sense of them, has to update itself with an evolving world. Um, and so, I mean, anyone listening to this podcast would say, you know, rightly, she's she's very left wing. Yeah, totally. Um, but there's a lot about left wing ideology that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, and putting on like my most possible empathetic hat, uh, there's a lot about right wing conservatism that does make sense to me or it makes sense as to why people would engage like that uh, with the world and with their communities and with other communities. So I think it's about moving beyond the binaries that really entrap uh, discussion and create the form of debate, which is never going to go further than agreement and disagreement. And that's not what we want. But I have to say, after giving a talk recently at a conference, um, <laughs> I think I might be moving towards anarchy because the more I think about the history of the nation state, why it exists, its purpose to just transfer wealth from one group to another, I'm really questioning um, the necessity of nation states, the effectiveness of centralized decision making, the capacity um, to respond globally when we live in a world with borders. Um, and, you know, anarchy is looking increasingly appealing and obviously not the Mad Max kind, but like the David Graeber kind. <laughs> so if anyone has any decent books on anarchy that they would recommend, uh, please leave a comment below. This is from Gus Schellenkins. How can we quickly change the way everyone on the planet understands and engages with the causes and effects of climate change so that we can have more concerted and faster progress to prepare for its effects and stop it becoming worse? And some of his suggestions were, you know, personal liability of directors and companies, national legislation, punitive costs. Uh, really good question. And if I may be that person, I think I want to deconstruct it. Um, how can we quickly change the way that everyone on the planet understands? I don't know if we can quickly change the way that everyone understands. The only way that I can imagine doing it quickly would be through eco-authoritarianism, essentially. Um, where you take control of the education system um, and educate directly and where you start to um, deliberately direct people's thoughts and creativities by punishing and rewarding certain ways of being. Now, obviously, that is done already uh, in the economies in the countries that we live in, which is why, you know, saying that we live in democracies is kind of laughable. Uh, but I don't think necessarily a more extreme version of the same ideology but under different intentions or for a different purpose would necessarily be any better. I really like the Bayo Akamalafi quote, his quote saying, the times are urgent, we need to slow down. I think that's really relevant. Um, and we also don't need to convince everyone. Like, <laughs> climate change is such a big picture topic. Like, really what we're talking about is... Um, local climatic change which is going to impact crops uh we're talking about immigration um cultural loss um rising sea levels like you know food systems collapsing um the risk of authoritarianism coming back in climate change is kind of used as the umbrella and i think it's a shame that we do that in a sense because we're we tend to lose sight of the very real problems that it actually means um and depending on where you are geographically and depending on uh, your privilege, your race, your class, your gender, the problems that climate change ex exacerbates from the already problematic system is going to be different. And I think people will probably be able to, I hope, um, learn and focus on the things that are important to them within a global understanding of this on some level is happening to everyone. Um, and I think that global understanding of we are all in this together could happen fairly quickly, um, given you know how we see people respond in times of war to suddenly becoming like raging nationalists, um, united against a common enemy. There is a way to see the 
um, effects of climate change as the enemy to create that global understanding. And then over time, I think, keep pushing the narrative that it's actually not the climate change that's the enemy, but rather the system that caused the climate change. Um, if it weren't urgent, we would go directly there and take our time, but times are urgent. So we need to pick and choose. Um, and I think we also need to be brave enough to pick and choose when to slow down, essentially. Um, so I think stories, the only real answer to that question is, is stories and whether it's quick or slow, most important thing is that we tell the stories that matter. Okay, next question from Mick in Geelong. Truly, deeply, madly, what do you, based on all the knowledge and inspiration you have acquired through your interviews, think this world will look like in 2100? Is that how we say that? 2100 or 2100? Hmm. Um, I don't know, Mick. <laughs> I really, I really don't know. Um, I have different visions for what it could look like. Um, some the eco-authoritarian or eco-fascistic approach where the crisis is used as an excuse by those who tend to concentrate power to further concentrate and perpetuate their own power, uh, take back control. I think that um, the other side of that is obviously, you know, oh, a global... <laughs> utopian eco dream um of i don't know anarchy I, that's probably further away in the future um i think no matter what and you can tell from my voice which one i think is more likely no matter what i think that we are seeing the end now of globalization as a project um and the increasing interest in national states to shore up their own resources and uh deepen certain alliances and also change certain alliances so um, I think it's very difficult to imagine a world in 2100 where the United States is still the top dog um, because even amongst the fossil fueled allied countries um, the biggest producers of fossil fuels which involves uh, includes the United States because they're the biggest producer and exporter of natural gas um, even that alliance is shifting um, with some of these countries moving more towards BRICS, um, which is China and Brazil and Russia. Now, these are big fossil fuel um, producing countries as well. However, they don't have the same ideology of the United States. Um, and it may be that there is some willingness to negotiate with one another a sharing of the pooled resources that they managed to capture by perhaps pushing a more green agenda um, in order just to topple the United States dominance. Now, that might be a bit of a pipe dream and I'm sure somebody listening to this is like, oh, didn't you see, you know, what happened at COP? Um, the oil producing nations are just interested in producing more oil and using COP as a front in order to do exactly that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I think that these people will also be aware that we're running out of oil. So it's kind of a, a last push um, to extract all that is economically viable in order to benefit from it. And also going green might be the one way to topple the United States dominance. And if these countries, these oil producing countries are aligning themselves with China, who is a massive fossil fuel importer, sure, but is also the beating heart of the green revolution, essentially, um, then it may show that they are willing to give up on one source of fuel if it would mean more political power. And essentially, everyone can afford to degrow a bit if the United States degrows massively by losing a, a huge source of its um economic income and not just that but also its political power uh, the fact that the united states gets to mostly decide where lng goes around the world especially with russia kind of out of the picture for europe makes it a very 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 powerful player if we are going to stay on a fossil fueled regime so it may be that this tension between china and the united states actually does the the green you know transition although i'm wary of that word um a boost I know that didn't really answer the question. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what the world will look like, but I think these are the kind of moves that are happening. 
There were two really beautiful questions on religion from Mary Babick and Liam. Um, and to summarize them, what role do you see for religious innovation or improvisation in our civilization's ongoing and unavoidable decline? I have this conversation a lot with somebody very dear to me who has experience both deeply within religion and um, experience of, of leaving and being on the out group. And I think when we started these conversations, him and I, six months ago, um, both of us were quite inclined to think that a, a new religion would be actually one of the quickest ways <laughs> to move the world towards something good by 2100. Um, and yet the more that we talked about language actually, and the written word and the very human need for certainty, the more that that seemed like possibly quite a dangerous idea. Again, it's one of these things that could maybe fix the problem now, but what problems would it cause down the line? Um, when I think about religion, I think about the written word. I think about that which has been written down very many years ago, that because of the nature of being written rather than spoken, remains true for the people who believe in that scripture or hold that belief. That's very dangerous when the world is moving so quickly. And I'm not even talking about the space of, you know, a thousand years or 2000 years or 3000 years. I'm talking about 20 years now. If we look at what technology is, is doing to our world and our economies and our politics, we don't live in the same world that we did in the 90s or even the early 2000s. And so the written word, whilst it has a lot of weight behind it, which is what makes it such a powerful tool, is inherently inflexible. And as you can see from the United States, people aren't even that keen on, you know, playing around with amendments, <laughs> which, you know, even though by their very nature, anyway, that's a different, <laughs> that's a different comedy routine. But nonetheless, I think faith, maybe religion is really, really important. And I think it is on these religions, these massive dominating religions that have been the source of a huge amount of war throughout history to innovate themselves and to respond to a world in a crisis and to channel whatever God um, they believe in and look to support and think about how to be a spiritual resource for a global world that is not only in strife but in a dire emergency. How can these religions incorporate the more than human world? How can these religions equalize the human and more than human world? How can these religions generate a respect for that which is living and temporary and perhaps begin to diminish the importance of a permanent afterlife that is perfect and the real sacred source of all human happiness, not, you know, this amazing planet with these amazing people where we are today. It's on everyone to respond to a world in crisis. And a lot of these religions do. I mean, a great example from very recent history, both culturally and within the context of religious leaders would be, you know, the topic of, of gay relationships and gay marriage, or, you know, women being religious leaders. Now, not every religion has gotten there, um, but it happened, uh, around the Western world, really. Um, and there's a lot of pushback, obviously, but that first step was made. We may lose it, we may regress, but it just goes to show that that kind of innovation is possible within religions as they respond to the modern culture. I think people definitely need God right now, whatever that God is, and they need to see it in everything and everyone. I had a wonderful religious experience in February, 2023, uh, doing ayahuasca. <laughs> which is a um, medicine from the jungles of Peru. And I met God. <laughs> and I did an episode, actually, the episode with Jude Carvin, I told this story, and it's also written on Planet Critical. There's a, there's a newsletter somewhere. I met God, and God was two women, and these two women were actually just, they were life. The, the, <laughs> the, the life force in the world, the energy of life. And over the course of that night, I learned that um, we are all life, we are all one. And I had that feeling of total equal dissolution. And then 
uh, later on, after I'd taken my second dose of medicine, I realized that um, life divided herself. Like the reason that we have this external or, or um, experience, the reason that we're not all just one big tree um, is because life divided herself to love herself. And so that's the only real meaning here. There's no reason as to why we're all here. It's one beautiful cosmic accident, but we make meaning by loving each other. And I think that kind of religious belief or experience could be really, really helpful for people. And I wish it on everyone. <laughs> this is quite a nice follow-up question, I think, to that. This is from Phoebe Bernard of the Stable Planet Alliance. Rachel, people talk of the gut-brain axis and the heart-brain axis. When you were moving towards planet critical, what was your road between your gut, your heart, and your mind? <sighs> My road felt pretty empty at that moment. When I was moving towards planet critical, I was coming out of um, a breakdown, essentially. And I was very unwell, and I'd taken a year to get back on my feet. Um, and I was just out of ideas. There wasn't really much going on in my gut or my brain, but maybe my heart. Um, I've always been someone that's had lots and lots of ideas and I've always been looking for the thing, her thing. I thought other people's things uh, were gonna be my thing a lot of the way throughout my 20s because I didn't have enough belief in myself. Um, and I had come out of a breakdown, written a novel during it, which was very painful. Um, and then had started working on this like business plan for the world's first sustainable publishing house. Um, and did that for six months, um, including sort of developing a product idea to raise the capital to set up the publishing house, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, at the end of the six months, the day before my 28th birthday, I believe, January 7th, <laughs> 2021, I burst into tears at the dinner table. Uh, because I didn't want to run a business and I, was, and I just I hadn't learned I hadn't learned to slow down all through my pretty serious breakdown I'd still been constantly producing and seeking and searching and all these kinds of things and I, I hadn't learned my lesson um, and so I sort of handed it over um, I was almost out of ideas my brain was totally overworked and um, my gut had been um, sort of eroded because of the reliance on my brain rather than anything else and in whatever moment of stillness that came out from that my heart finally got a chance to speak um, and said you know I want to keep learning and so part of the idea for the sustainable publishing house had been a, a podcast um, an other focused podcast where you know you get really massive authors in um, being interviewed about a debut um, author's novel, which I thought was a great idea because why not use their platform to platform somebody else? And I just thought it'd be a really good excuse to speak to people that I find really interesting. So I launched it and it was like the, finally the alignment of that gut brain, heart brain access um, that I'd been looking for all of these years. And doing Planet Critical has taught me to really maintain that balance, to not just fall into my mind, but to practice keeping an open, curious and brave heart, to listen to my gut as it calls from the depths of my belly with wisdom. <laughs> I'm not sure where it picked up, but always seems to be right. Um, and my brain, which is, you know, a really great tool and at moments really powerful, um, but it's actually mostly powerful when it's a conduit for my gut and my heart. Um, that was a really difficult lesson to learn, uh, but I'm so glad that I learned it. Okay, moving on. So I had three questions from Kavan, Patrick Kelly, and the wonderful Pamela McGill, um, all around the same theme. So I've boiled it down into this question. How has what you've learned from Planet Critical changed you? Your mindset, priorities, and how you live. I guess I just kind of answered that um, in that it's changed me into being a much um, more loving and open version of myself. 
and a much more trusting version of myself which is ironic given you know it's my job to like wade through all the shit that's going on in the world I think the biggest thing for me is that it's given me a sense of living in alignment with my values and with my skill set and with who I want to be um and that's always what I was looking for and I really really struggled to find it in anything I did because I'm just um, I don't think I'm really built for being employed, certainly not within an institution or a big organization. Um, I need my freedom. I need freedom to explore and to be curious and to make mistakes. Um, and so living a life that's in alignment with my values has changed everything for me. It's changed my levels of self-respect. It's changed my capacity to trust other people my capacity to listen to myself and to filter information um, and to make decisions. It's massively changed my capacity to say no, love saying no now. It's my favorite word. <laughs> and I think fundamentally it teaches me every day how to be the best version of myself. And if I manage it here, then I should be managing it everywhere in every aspect of my life. As for my priorities and how I live, well, it's massively changed how I live. Um, I'm no longer at the whims of any employer which makes me very happy um I travel regularly and get to manage my time which means that some weeks I won't work at all and other weeks I will not stop working um it means I get to choose how I spend my time as well um picking stories that matter and doing deep dives on them um, being able to bypass the herd and go in the direction that I think is important based on the synthesis of knowledge that I've developed over the course of the, the past few years of doing this show. It's allowed me to be gentler, <laughs> much gentler, because the more that you learn about system dynamics, the more that you learn that all of us are just components within a system. And yes, some of us may have more power than others and should be behaving much differently, but we are not taught strength and we're not taught vulnerability and we're not taught love. And so unsurprising that the people at the top who get there through a distinct capacity to forget even the innate sense of these human values um, are then incapable of showing that kind of leadership. It, it just tracks, it just makes sense. As for my priorities, I think a huge amount about food and food systems, and I worry a lot about it. Um, I was never really interested in being a property owner or um, being employed or, or any of these things, really. I was, I was never interested in it. I was, I was always a bit radical, I suppose. Um, as for now, I think all of these um, values that were quite innate have become quite polished and I'm now able to use them to think critically about my present and my future. My priority now is spending time with the people I love and um, being in places that I want to be and doing the things that I want to do. Um, so that, for example, uh, is moving country to be in a better climate for now. Um, or like I said, managing my time so that I can be there for my friends and my family. But I worry a huge amount about the future and I feel actually quite stuck. I really worry about where we're going to get food if the worst comes to pass and we hit three or four degrees warming, which is looking likely. I worry about where to migrate to, what passport, you know, to get, should there be one that I'm, should, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to get now. Um, I worry about, you know, if I have a different passport to my partner and different nationality and the borders go up what will we do how will we do it um, should I be trying to get to the people I love as quickly as possible and and rooting down there so that it becomes harder to rip me out and if the time comes I mean and I don't have answers to any of these questions but these are the things that I worry about and then you throw in the <laughs> having kids not having kids thing wow it gets very dark very fast but with a priority of caretaking which I have learned from Planet Critical <laughs> um, and the amazing people I speak to I feel competent and confident in my ability to navigate these problems as they arise 
and I will merely continue to lambast myself at night before I fall asleep that I'm not acting on them in advance despite all of my knowledge. Ayo, still human. Okay, there was another set of questions from Glenn Bennett and Ben, the mysterious singular Ben, um, about government. How important is the United States government to the health of the planet? And can climate action happen without the government? The United States government is absolutely bloody critical to the health of the planet. Um, and whether or not another gov government would be the problem if it wasn't the United States that's sort of in charge right now, that is the paradigm that we live in. And I don't think that the health of the planet can be achieved without the United States government um, either getting on board or being toppled. And I kind of talked about that um, earlier in this episode in a response to another question. I think there are perhaps different ways as well to topple governments, including people sort of extricating themselves from the system and creating their own forms of governance. However, I had this discussion with somebody recently that um, said that that would be enough, really, that we could governed by citizen assembly and leave the the politicians in you know the house of lords or in the government buildings and they can pretend that they're you know they get to make believe essentially play act the role of being in charge while while we're actually doing the hard work i am very worried about the kind of violence that we will see from governments um as things begin to collapse and the violence that they will be capable of wreaking on their own people and I've seen this a lot um, around what's happening in Palestine right now. Really astute people, particularly young people, saying if they can do this here, it means that they can do it there as well. Or if they can do it there, they can do it here and it will be us that are next. Because what's happening there is extraction. Uh, Israel is extracting land from the Palestinian people and has been doing so for a very, very long time. So the dominating force or the elite force is extracting from the vulnerable. I think most of us, and most of us uh, listening to this podcast, most listeners and subscribers, belong to that set of vulnerable, maybe not on a global level, uh, but if you think about yourself as a as a geo tag where you are located um unless you are a member of the elite you are a member of the vulnerable group essentially <sighs> and so yeah i worry about governments like the united states that have been fundamentally founded on violence and extraction of um other people's will begin to violently extract from their peoples when they are no longer able to uh, export their colonialism, essentially. Which is why I don't think just exiting the system will be enough. And why I think the only climate action that can happen without the government would be a total dissolution of government itself um, and a move towards like true left-wing you know, anarchy, really, um, where local communities get to decide what is good for them and feed that back into a centralized system that doesn't have uh, control. So for now, I think we need the government. Although, also, <laughs> climate action is happening without the government uh, all around the world. So, sorry, I should have said that as well. Climate action is happening everywhere with government all around the world and has been happening for centuries without government all around the world. And the only reason that we truly know the state of the world and things are moving incrementally in a semi better direction is because of the climate action that people have undertaken all around the world without government however i think if we are going to see a good 2100 2100 um then we will need government and i think that very nicely leads us on to frank grimes's question uh who is a rapper by the way and has written a climate change rap that'll be going out on we will bear witness uh at the end of january but you can also find it on youtube for now his question is do you think mainstream centrist politics will ever come round to the idea of degrowth or the steady state economy i guess mainstream centrist politics will change and update uh the center that exists now only can because of the continued extraction of wealth from natural resources and from human labor and all of these kinds of things. And that is going to be fundamentally impossible on the same scale 
uh, in the future because either we are going to see a, a recession due to the collapse of ecological systems which will impact industry and the collapse of the financial industry etc 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 or we're going to avoid that recession by implementing degrowth um so the mainstream center won't exist in the future um and either it will be because they did come around to degrowth or the steady state economy or it will be because you know we've swung massively to the right to to deal you know to put a strong man in charge to deal with the 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 terrible recession and the loss of lives and collapse of ecosystems and all these kinds of things so i think this is really really important when we think about the future and people talk about the future it is not going to look how it looks today no matter what no matter what happens it cannot it cannot for so many reasons for the you know due to laws of physics uh, due to the way the economy functions, due to human culture. We are not in a steady state economy. We're in a growing economy, which means that it will always need more input in order to continue growing. And that's not possible because it's putting strain on the planet. So at some point, the planet is going to collapse unless it degrows. It's, it's really that simple. So when that happens, we're not entirely sure. I think, you know, in the next 20 years, that's really what we're looking at. Maybe even quicker. Um... And I think that really highlighting that the future is going to look different no matter what, it kind of liberates people a little bit. It liberates them from this conservatism of um, wanting things to stay the same because that is safe. And it's an impulse I totally understand. But the sen- like this, whether or not you think it's safe for people or for the world or for yourself or your families, it's not going to be around. Um, so conservatism doesn't actually apply in this context um of like this for this particular crisis um because you cannot save something that's growing if it's the growth that is the problem um so yeah i think whenever you're entering into conversations with people about this in the future like putting that forward as an initial um framing essentially really opens up the possibility of discussing new ideas ah i love this question from inez smith can women save the world? Around dinner tables, I would say, I think I say very often that women can save the world. Um, but obviously it's not that simple. I think the first thing, no, maybe the second thing that you learn in feminism is that the patriarchy hurts men too. And that women can be patriarchal as well. So it's not that men are this massive problem. Um, although, you know, a lot of us women have some massive problems with men um but men women no matter what your gender is you're suffering under this system of exploitation and extraction and colonialism um even at the top i mean you know no matter how spoiled uh like the the royal family might be for instance imagine being that bound to an identity that um if you want to challenge or break from then you have to leave behind your family. Um, I don't think that this world has created an easy life for anyone because it has disabused us of ease in order to reach for success, success that is very narrowly defined. Um, And women fall into that trap as well. There is some research that suggests that women are better long-term thinkers and better strategists and better as well at collective decision-making and empathy and all these kinds of things. And men are really, really good at risk-taking um cool great it should be that more women are in leadership positions certainly a very quick way to lower a company or a nation's carbon emissions is to put women in a leadership position um and the first three countries that um committed to loss and damages at uh cop 26 i believe or cop 27 were women uh were led by women sorry the nations weren't women but (laughs) the nations were led by women um so I would very much like to see a far more diversely represented uh, leadership group from around the world. But I'm very nervous of um, this rhetoric that men are the problem um, and that we essentially need to get rid of all the men, which I hear a lot um, because, I mean, these poor boys, like imagine being a young boy today and growing up hearing that. And then we wonder why figures like Andrew Tate who tell them that, their masculinity isn't a problem and they are allowed to be a man becomes so popular. We need 
leading figures for everyone, I think. Um, figures that show us how to be kind and generous and strong and moral and daring and considerate. Like the full character, plethora, multiplicity of what it is to be human, not divided down gender lines, not divided down man and women and masculine and feminine. We're all lacking. We are all lacking in the capacity to show the best of ourselves at points because that's what it is to be a fallible, you know, biological organism. And certainly if more of us were less lacking, the world probably wouldn't be in crisis in the way that it is. Divide and conquer is a really old tactic. We know how it works. We see it played out politically all the time. I've been a really big proponent of the gender debate for a very, very long time, but I'm beginning to see it as yet another divide and conquer tactic that keeps us from keeping our eye on the real enemy, which is the systemic propulsions that atomize us and alienate us and isolate us, make us sick and make the world sick around us. That's not a gender issue. Violence is probably a gender issue and we live in a very violent world. So I think if we flipped the question and said, can women save the world from male violence? I would say no. But can men save the world from male violence? Yes. And I look forward to hearing your plan about how to do that, gents. <laughs> okay, this is from Zez. What helps you stay steadfast and optimistic in the face of so much knowledge of how deeply tragic our situation is? Uh, and this is coupled with a very similar question from uh, Tia Romi. Yeah. <laughs> I get to speak with amazing people every day who are working on the front lines of the problem, who are bearing witness, who are staying strong, and who are trying to find solutions for the small part of it that they're working on. I get to speak to people every day who are courageous and wise and considerate and kind and loving and funny. And so that's how I stay steadfast and optimistic. I think I'm much more optimistic about uh, humanity now than I was prior to starting this work. Although perhaps less optimistic about um, the damage that I think will be wreaked uh, before the end of the century. So yeah, people. Our situation is tragic, but God, I mean, what a time to be alive as well. To be so terribly and wonderfully connected to so many kinds of people all around the world and to see really the globality of our, of our struggles, the universality of our desires, of our warmth, it feels like a miracle in a way. And I'm really glad to be witnessing it and to be throwing my hat in the ring in whatever way possible. The world is full of love and full of magic and full of art and creativity and wonder. If it weren't, there would be nothing to save. So just by the fact that you feel something by looking at the world, you feel sadness that reveals a very deep love there and that there is something worth saving. And that is the most wonderful and beautiful thought and feeling that we can hold on to. And this question is actually related um, to that feeling, I think. This is from Graham Jones. He says, members of Novara Media say it is very important to them that they work in a team with editors. You seem to be all alone. How do you manage? I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm not alone. This is not work that I do alone. I mean, the work bit of it, I do alone, but I'm not alone. Um, managing a website and a podcast and a newsletter is very doable when you don't have much else to do um, and when you just decide that you're going to do it. And I don't have kids. I don't have dependents. Um, I'm at a very sort of liberated time in my life. And so it's very feasible for me. Um, but I'm not alone. I speak to people every day and I <laughs> different people on different um, um, apps, you know, like uh, uh, Tim Garrett, who's an amazing physicist. 
um, him and I are on Twitter quite regularly. Like I DM him questions about, you know, physics and about his opinion on things and all this sort of stuff. You know, I, I call my really good friend Paddy Lohman very regularly, multiple times a week to get his opinion on things and episodes as well. And, you know, I think once or twice he's listened to an episode before it's gone out just because I, you know, I had some questions around my framing of it. I call the amazing Ali Rowe as well, who's just this wonderful architect of activism and kindness um, to stay in touch, really stay in touch with, with what's happening on the ground because that's really, really important. I get emails from Reverend Billy Tallon and Henrik Nordberg uh, of very different themes, but both equally important to me about the state of the world and what to do about it. Whenever I see my good friend, Ali Dowling, I, you know, we just spend hours and hours talking about all of this kind of stuff. And she really challenges me and she challenges um, some of the harder parts of my thinking and forces me to look at things in a way that sometimes I find difficult. And that's why I keep calling her and keep seeing her. Also because she's an amazing person. <laughs> Um, but Ali, you really challenged me, babe. <laughs> and I love you for it. Um, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I am constantly being fed into every day and constantly feeding back, constantly getting little signals from my mycelium network of, of amazing people. Um, and that's what makes it doable. And apart from that, um, you know, I quite like just sort of logging on and getting my head down for you know eight nine ten hours and just doing so yeah i i manage because i can and i'm very fortunate to be in that situation okay this final question is from tia romi um and it's a beautiful question and i'm gonna read it out in full to you all i listened to your episode with george monbio and you both mentioned the machine ratcheting up this is despite the well-meaning people shouting from the rooftops in protest for decades, if not centuries, if we reach all the way back to Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and John Muir. Do you feel that your podcast and similar endeavours from other people, such as Monbio, Nate Hagens, Jen Bendel, James Hansen, Resilience.org, etc., make any difference, or are you bound to bark as the caravan moves on? If the latter is the case, are you at peace with it? Is it enough for you that you tried as Louise Harris sings in her song. Do you think humanity will have a change of heart at the 11th hour, or do you think that the machine will run until it hits the hard physical, biological, and climatic boundaries? What an amazing question. Thank you, Taya. I think it has to be enough that we tried, because we may fail. And the failure will have a terrible impact all around the world and on all of us but what we're doing here is archiving a different way of thinking in that context so say we fail we are archiving a different way of thinking and of being and of daring and of feeling we are showing that humanity is good and kind and brave and tried and fundamentally, you know, revealing different ways of organizing, different ways of being. Um, and I think that that archive is really, really important. And I think that it will mean that it's not a failure. I often worry if I'm not doing enough, but I think the point is being ready to do if and when the time comes. I think the point is committing yourself, no matter what that means. Maybe one day that will mean stopping Planet Critical, for example, um, which gives me the life that I want and, as I said, really feels living aligned with my values and throwing all of my energy at uh, something else, something bigger, somebody else's something, maybe like a pan-European Green Party, for example. Um, and that would be a sacrifice, a self-sacrifice. Um, but I would do it. So when I worry sometimes that I'm not doing enough, I have to remember that some things don't yet exist and it is the commitment, not the form, that's important. And I think it's because of that very commitment rather than obsession with form that little things like Planet Critical 
um, or Nate Show the Great uh, Simplification, Gems Book, Resilience.org. These attempts, I think that is why they make a difference um, because they're not flashes in the pan. Um, they're not dictates. They're not, uh, they're not even trying to sell you anything. <laughs> We're not trying to sell you anything. Um, I think that's exactly why they make a difference because there's nothing more heartening than seeing uh, committed people or a group of committed people or people committed to something bigger than themselves. And I mean, Planet Critical must be doing something kind of right because I'm amazed at how many of you listen now. Um, we're coming up to 10,000 subscribers on the website and growing all the time. If it wasn't making any difference, it wouldn't be finding the people it needed to or people wouldn't be signing up. What I do isn't big enough at any scale to start to impact systems, but it is big enough on the scale to impact individuals. And so therein lies the difference. And if we're all components of systems as individuals and as networked individuals, then we can start to make that difference together. Now, I don't believe that systemic change will only come from individual changes. Um, and I think that this deliberate focus on individuals by, you know, PR companies and governments and fossil fuel companies and all this kind of stuff is like um, very, very evasive and dangerous. That said, as long as we don't have access to the big levers of systemic power or change, such as, you know, being in government or um, being the, I don't know, CEO of BlackRock, I don't know, whatever, wherever these people are, I'm not even sure if they exist too much. But as long as we're not those people, <laughs> then doing what we can is important. It will always be enough that I tried because I think doing this work has finally rid me of any self-aggrandizing desire to change the world. So, say my utopian vision for 2100 does come true. I think even in that context, it might be important to frame the success as we tried. Not as we succeeded, we did it, we stopped it history ends here but still within the understanding of we tried we tried and we had an impact and now it's important to keep trying to have an impact and teaching our kids to keep trying to have an impact because sustainability isn't about an end game it's about learning how to live and there's nothing i would rather spend my time trying all right, everyone, I think that's enough for me on this. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for submitting your questions. Apologies to those of you um, whose question wasn't read out. I hope that um, everything, though, that you asked essentially was covered in this episode. Um, let me know if you want me to do this again annually um, or let me know if you would like me to be interviewed by someone. I finally had an idea, actually, for who could do it. Um, but I had the idea at like 2 a.m. last night and I'm recording this on Tuesday the 2nd of January and this episode goes out um, very, very soon. <laughs> so I couldn't get it done in time. And I wanted to answer all of your questions anyway because you've all been so kind to take the time and submit them. So thank you all for being with me on this journey. Thank you all for subscribing to Planet Critical. Thank you all for supporting Planet Critical. It would not be possible and it wouldn't be fun and interesting without you all there with me on this journey as the community. So thank you for your bravery, for your time, for your resilience, for your courage, for your love, for your generosity, for your warmth. Thank you for your commitment. Happy New Year, everyone. May we keep trying in 2024.